Welcome to the Sully Plantation Antique Auto Show, held each June near Washington Dulles International Airport. I'm your host, Duane Perrin, and I like old cars. Join me as I show you some of the cars on display and talk to some of their owners. We're talking to John Howell, who is the coordinator of the uh, Sully Plantation meet. Uh, can you uh, tell us who puts on this meet? The meet is put on jointly by our club, which is the George Washington chapter of the Model A Ford Club of America, and also the Fairfax County Park Authority. Uh, is this a part of a national club? Yes, we're a chapter of actually two national Model A Ford Clubs. There's the Model A Ford Club of America, and we're also a chapter of the Model A Restorers Club. Uh, I guess nationwide, of the two clubs, there's probably 20 to 25,000 members. Would it be safe to say then that there are probably 20 to 25,000 Model A's still running around? I would say that there's a lot more than that. The majority of our club members have far more than just one car. They have a number of Model A Fords and sometimes other makes of cars and newer cars. Well, you certainly have a beautiful day for a meet here today. How many uh, cars do you think you're going to have? We'll probably have 400 cars registered in the show, plus we'll have another anywhere from 50 to 100 cars in the car corral, which is where cars that are for sale are put. Where did they, all these cars come from? Do you, are they all from around the Washington area? Um, most of them are from the Washington area, which as I said earlier includes probably uh, a hundred mile radius of here, uh, but it, yeah, they're all just about all from this area. Well, uh, it certainly looks like you're going to have a good turnout and you're going to have a good time today. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sully Country Home was completed in 1794 on a 3,000 acre tract of land. Sully is now a Fairfax County Park. You know what that is? Thanks. Stanley Steamer. Good morning. What is your name, sir, and where are you from? I'm Jim Keith from McLean, Virginia. And what kind of car is this that we're standing next to? It's a 1910 Stanley Steamer. Uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, about the Stanley? What uh, the uh, steam cars are, are very rare items, and uh, we don't see them anymore nowadays. What? Uh, how did it work? Well, they uh, they were made from 1902 through 1924. Um, <clears throat> they have a boiler under here and a burner beneath the boiler to heat the water. I carry 70 gallons of water and I can go about a mile per gallon. A mile per gallon of water? A mile per gallon of water. What about yeah, fuel? What is I use kerosene, get about six miles per gallon of kerosene. They weren't overwhelmingly efficient. And how did you get this car from McLean to here today? I drove it out. You drove it on the regular highway? I can go 45, 50 on, on the road, pretty comfortably. I noticed that the, the car has the steering wheel on the right-hand side. Is that, uh, it's not a European car, is it? No, it was standard even in all American cars up till about 1908, <laughs> 9 or 10. The latest Stanleys all have the steering wheel on the other side as well. And this is a, a very interesting horn here. Is that uh... that horn is not original equipment? I got that horn in London. It's a 1910 horn. It's called a British Boar Constrictor horn. It's, uh, it's very nice for Stanley because it spits steam. It's, I'll show you. It honks that way, and it also spits venom. <laughs> 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 what uh, caused you to get interested in the Stanley? Well, I got first Stanley, and the first Stanley I bought was 1947. I don't really know quite how that got me. Um, I saw an ad for one for sale up in Boston, went up and bought it. And uh, 
and I had a terrible time with it because I didn't know how to operate them and there was no one around where I lived then in, in Charlottesville who could tell me how to operate it. And I kept it for several years and then I finally gave up. How long have you had this car? I've had this 24 years. And did you do the restoration work yourself? I did. I bought it from a man who had bought this car to restore it, took it apart over a two-year period, then had an elective uh, operation on his ulcers from which he never recovered. He died about a month later. And I bought the car from his estate. Well, it's certainly a beautiful car, and I wish you luck today. Well, I have big fun with it. Yeah, thank Thanks you. a lot. Pleasure. the owner of a very rare car. Can you tell us uh, what is your name and where you're from? Uh, Dwayne, I'm Walter Rosh. I'm from right here in Fairfax. Uh, the car I've got here today is a 1926 Wills St. Clair five-passenger sedan. Uh, this car originated in Charleston, West Virginia, and it has basically been in Charleston its whole life. Uh, I just bought the car last November and started showing it this summer. But this is one of the uh, few Will Sinclair that's in original condition. Um, as you can see, the bright work, although it's somewhat faded, uh, it is still original. The black paint on the fenders and the, the blue paint on the rest of the body is original. Uh, you want me to show you some of the interesting aspects of the car. The, uh, this is what they call the winter front shutter system. It's like a thermostat until the car gets warmed up it's closed to keep the cold air from going into the engine. The uh, bumper medallions with the goose on them are unique to this particular car. I noticed that goose is repeated on the uh, on the radiator ornament and the uh, emblem. Yes, this was uh, Mr. Will's um, uh, logo or his emblem or his mascot. Uh, they call it the Grey Goose in the Will St. Clair Club. As you can see, it's, it's repeated in several places on the car, on the winter front and on the bumper medallions. And uh, the, the logo on the license plate is actually a reproduction from uh, some of the sales literature that they had out back in those days. What uh, was uh, unusual about the, uh, the mechanics of this car? It was a very advanced car for its day. Mr. Wills uh, was one of the highest regarded uh, engineers in Detroit back in the early 20s and he decided to start manufacturing his own car in 1921 and when he did he wanted the car to be lightweight uh, but of a very high value or a very high quality so he engineered the the car with four-wheel hydraulic brakes his motors had an overhead cam engine which was not new back in those days but for a production car it was uh, fairly unique back at that time uh, a lot of his engine parts were made out of lightweight aluminum and also he used extensive use of the uh, a steel which is called molybdenum steel which was a lightweight but uh, strong alloy uh, and was fairly new back then uh, also. Could you uh, show us the engine? Yes, uh-huh. Dwayne, this Will St. Clair has the uh, overhead cam six-cylinder engine, which was manufactured by the company in 1925 and 1926. Uh, previous to that time, uh, starting in 1921, there was a V8 engine, which was the standard uh, for these cars. Uh, as I said, this particular engine has the overhead cam uh, in it. The, the bright work that you see here is aluminum castings which were utilized to uh, lighten the weight and make the car a little bit uh, quicker. Also the uh, sub-block is aluminum and the rods in the engine are aluminum. The uh, reservoir that you see here is for the hydraulic system to pump up the uh, pressure in the brakes when they get low. And uh, the engine itself holds 11 quarts of oil, and there is no oil filter on this particular engine. And the water system holds almost five gallons of water. Uh, 
So when you start it up on a cold morning, it's going to take a little while before it warms up. I bet it does. <laughs> Did you have to do anything to the engine when you got the car, or was it uh, in running shape? This engine, uh, as it sits now, is basically, uh, with about 85,000 miles on it, is original condition. Only the paint has been redone. The major components inside the engine are as they, as they left the factory. Um, so it holds up pretty well, and it starts on the third crank, just like it always has. Amazing. So it, so it runs, uh, runs pretty smooth for an old car. Great. OK, thank you. Uh, yes, sir. example of a car that's still owned by its original owner. It was purchased, it's a 1930 Model A coupe and it was purchased in 1930 by the United States government for $557. During the early 30s it was used in the Death Valley area of California and from the late 30s until 1965 survey U.S. Uh, Geological Survey geologist Levi Noble used this vehicle to support his geologic mapping activities in the Mojave Desert. After Mr. Noble's death in 1965, the Ford was driven from Valiermo, California to the Geological Survey's Western Region Center in Menlo Park, California. It remained there until shipped to the U.S. National Center in Reston, Virginia in June 1974. This vehicle is still operable and in remarkably good condition. It has not been restored. Its present condition is primarily due to Mr. Noble's effort. He personally attended for its care and maintenance when it was in his custody. After well over 100,000 miles in difficult terrain, this Model A is being honorably retired. just about any car, but uh, we have here an example of what great lengths some owners will go to. Can you tell me your name, sir, and where are you from? Philip Caney. I'm from Falls Church, Virginia. And what kind of car is this? This is a 1960 Studebaker Hawk. And this year they just had a Hawk. They didn't have a silver or golden Hawk. It has a 289 V8 with a four-barrel carburetor. And the engine still runs strong. And the transmission's been rebuilt. Uh, the brake system's been rebuilt. So driving-wise, it's perfectly safe, and uh, it'll go well over the legal speed limit. Uh, Body-wise, yes, there's still a lot of work to go. Um, Tell us about what you intend to do with this car. Well, right here, we have the uh, back of the rear, uh, rear of the front fender. It's a typical spot that a Studebaker uh, rusts out on. They have no uh, plastic fender wells or anything, and the water comes up here and it rusts out. And there's a firm that makes a, what they call a patch panel. And what you do is cut this out in here, weld in your new panel, and you're ready to go. And I have one for each side. Uh, I have one for the bottom of the door here. That's going to be repaired. Now when we get to the back, uh, they don't make any panels for that uh, pre-made, and we're going to have to make some ourselves. And by belonging to a club, both the Studebaker Owners Club and the uh, Model A Club, which I also have a Model A, uh, there's enough people around with welding ability, painting, uh, sandblasting cabinets and things like that that with their help uh, using their equipment I can work on this. So you intend to do most of the work yourself? I intend to do most of myself. One, I can't afford to uh, have somebody professionally do it. Uh, you're talking probably ten, twelve thousand dollars that take this somewhere, have somebody completely redo it. Uh, my wife hopefully is going to help me with sewing some of the upholstery. Okay. Uh, I've bought a an old industrial type sewing machine that will take the heavier material so she doesn't need to use her good machine. And getting parts for it uh, for the Studebakers is pretty easy. They, um, when they shut down in 1966, there were plenty of used parts and new parts still around on the dealer shelves. And I was just up uh, a Studebaker meet. I needed a uh, blower motor for my heater fan. 
and I bought a brand new one in a Studebaker box, all ready to go, right fresh from the factory. And, and they haven't made those since 1966. Sounds but great. But they're around. Sounds great. Well, you certainly got your work cut out for yes, you. Yes, I, I think do. you'll be busy for a little while. Quite a while. I all have right. a before and the after, well, maybe 10 years, <laughs> uh, maybe a little sooner than that. But hey, Best of luck with your project. Thank you. Thank you. What is your name, sir, and where are you from? Joe Cady from Bethesda, Maryland. And uh, we're here in the flea market area. I notice uh, you have an, an old car or not? I don't have an old car now. I've, I've had old cars, and I'm now into automobilia, bits and pieces from old cars. What is automobilia? Well, it's uh, anything from bud vases to hood ornaments to emblems to uh, old car ads to books. Uh, uh, old script. Now, what is that? It's a script off the radiator of a, of a uh, Swiss truck. Swiss truck? Swiss truck, yeah. What, uh, what other kinds of things do you, uh, do you collect these things or just sell them? I collect hood ornaments. And uh, one starts collecting, accumulating, and pretty soon you start narrowing down and uh, trading some of the old collection for the new collection. So you try to get as many different kinds from different cars as you can? Primarily. I've got about 200 uh, factory hood ornaments currently in my collection. From 1907, uh, there's a couple up in the 50s, but mostly from 1907 to the mid-30s. And uh, what? Uh, some of these were pretty elaborate. Can you show us some examples of? It's probably one of the oldest continuing radiator ornaments in use. It was originally used in the early 1900s by Rolls, and it's still found on Rolls automobiles. There's uh, quite some artwork in some of these. It's uh, she's a classy gal. Well, I'd say this one. I'm absolutely certain that one's a whippoorwill. I notice you also have uh, model cars here. Is that a... Uh, That's a... Uh, it, it's kind of uh, well, something to do in the winter when I can't go out in the garage and build uh, bases for my mascots. It keeps me out of the kitchen, uh, off the TV, and from feeding my face. So I build model cars in the winter, keep some, and put the rest out in, at the flea markets. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, this is a 1912 Hupmobile Roadster in the car corral section. It's asking price is $15,000 for this car. This is a 1951 Nash Ambassador. Sometimes they, these cars are referred to as bathtub Nashes because they look like an inverted bathtub with the styling with the front wheels covered. If you've got some time on your hands and you want a project to keep you busy at night, Here's a 1936 Oldsmobile that you could buy for $800. Needs a little tender, loving care, as they say. Here's a 68 Mustang in absolutely fantastic condition, and he's asking $8,500 for this one. This is a 1956 DeSoto. Don't says it's an Indianapolis pace car, and the price sign says the best offer under twenty thousand dollars. This is a 57 Ford Thunderbird. That's one of the uh, nicest looking Thunderbirds, in my opinion. This gray car they're asking fourteen thousand five hundred for. And right beside it, we see another 57, a yellow car, and asking 17.5 for that one. I'd like to talk to uh, some of the uh, spectators here today. Uh, who are you, and where are you from? I'm Ron and Trish Levers from Alexandria, Virginia. And your wife? The same. Okay, and uh, tell us, what do, you, what do you think of this show? Well, I think it's fantastic. Uh, many, many more vehicles than I expected to be here, and. I think it's very well organized and very well displayed. Uh, it's one of the nicest shows I've ever attended. Do you have an old car or are you interested in old cars? I'm interested in an old one, however, I do not want it, own one at the present time. You're kind of looking. Yeah. Have you looked at the cars down in the for sale? Line? Yes, we did. We just left there and uh, there's a number of them that are interesting, but uh, again, I don't know if we're going to make that move yet. Sure. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. Goodbye. <laughs>
cars often have interesting stories that go with them. Uh, uh, this car, as I understand, has a very interesting story. Could you start by telling us what is your name and where are you from, sir? Uh, Benny Leonard from Vienna, Virginia. And what's the story with this car? Well, this was a $35 car that was uh, going on its way to the junkyard. And uh, I didn't like VWs in the beginning, but there was something about the color and the no top, and it looked kind of pitiful. And it took pity on it and decided well, to yeah. adopt it. Right. So we, uh, we brought it home and cleaned the mice out of the, the inside of it, and uh, it sat for five years underneath an oak tree, and it was full of leaves. So we got it all cleaned out and put it in the garage and looked at it for about a week, decided what we were going to do with it. And I wanted to learn how to spray paint and restore cars. So after three years, this is what we got. It uh, took that long to do it. So you did all the work yourself? We did all the work, me and the family. Uh, we always, I always show it with a little book in the back that says restored by the Leonard family. Because the wife helped me on the top, the kids helped me do the sanding. Uh, every time I needed some help, they were always around. About how many hours worth of labor do you figure went into this car? Well, we don't like to talk about that, but I guess it's close to 1,500 hours part-time <laughs> over three years. It's quite a project. Right. It had no top on it, neither we had to make we had to sew the top together and get another car to go by for, for a pattern. And uh, so it's quite a bit of hand sewing on these old cars as far as putting the top on it. Right. But it's certainly in beautiful shape now. It's, uh, what kind of trophies have you won with it? Well, normally first and second place we've been taken, it's just, it's hard to tell. Like we've got a lot, a lot of competition today, I don't know today. Uh, this was a, actually a, uh, a 62 that was sold in 63, so it's got a lot of 62 parts on it uh, that I didn't know. I didn't know this when I bought it. I thought it was all mixed up. But uh, doing research on it, I found out that the 62s had the clear parking lights on the front and the horn ring, and the 63 did not have it on it. So this was sold as a 63, but it's actually a 62. I guess it's just like anybody else, the VW had to get rid of all the old parts they uh, had before they, Right. Well, I wish you best of luck, and there, there's okay. certainly a lot of competition here, but this is a, a very nice car. Thank you. Mike Kearney from uh, Great Falls, Virginia. And what kind of car is this that you have here today? It's a 1937 Rolls-Royce Phantom III. Have you owned this car long? I've had it about 10 years. And where did, where did it come from? How did you come by it, it? Actually, the car came out of Ireland and belonged to a friend of my dad's over there, and uh, we brought it back over here and restored it. How did you get it from Ireland to here? We, well, that's a good story. We brought it over on Flying Tiger Airlines, and they actually used it in their uh, commercial, showing that they flew only the best. And they had this rolling out of the front end of the Flying Tiger up at, uh, then, of course, it was uh, Kennedy Airport up in New York. Sounds great. It's a rare one. They only built uh, 540 of them originally, and this is the only one they ever built that looked like this, with this particular body. What, uh, what kind of a body does it have? It's a, a gurney nutting, gurney, which is a very special, very popular body. It's all aluminum, weighs uh, two and a half tons. And that's an original set of tires that's on that car. Really? Yeah, that's I mean, they're not the originals that were on the car, but they are original tires. Same time. That we Same time the, came, the car came with them. Yeah. yeah. What make are they? They're Dunlop. Okay, thank you, sir. My pleasure. This is a, a Rio Speedwagon truck. Everybody's heard of REO Speedwagon, the rock group, and this is the vehicle that inspired that name. The Rio name came from REO, which were the initials of Ransom Eli Olds. He started a company first, and he called the car Oldsmobile. And after a while, he sold that company and started another company, and he, since the Oldsmobile name was no longer his to use, he started uh, used his initials and uh, called it the Rio. They made both cars and trucks. This is a 1953 Packard Caribbean. That was Packard's sporty model, specially built. They built very few of them. 
Okay, we're back with John Howell again. We started the day with him and we're ending up the day with him. It's just about time to award the trophies. Uh, how many classes are there, John? Uh, I forget exactly, but there's over 30 classes of cars that we have. And as far as the trophies, we award uh, either first, second, and third place, depending on how many cars are in each class. Uh, you know, we'll be up to three classes, three trophies. So there are quite a few winners. Uh. They'll, as you can see by the trophies behind us, there are a large number of trophies that we're going to be awarding. There is no best of show, so to speak, because of the wide variety of automobiles that we have in the show. The trophies have been awarded and it's time to head for home. Let's listen to the sound of this Shelby Mustang as it leaves. I've really enjoyed this show and I hope you have too. See you all at Sully again next June.